Okay, this is lecture 20. We're going to speak about uh, discharge measurements uh, in this lecture, and I'm going to essentially cover weir measurements, what the, uh, define what a weir is, and we're going to talk about the uh, uh, development of the equations uh, that uh, predict the uh, flow rate uh, from various observations of the, of the stage and the geometry of the weir. We'll talk about flumes, and then we'll talk about the velocity area me measurement method, which is what we'll use in the field lab coming up here in about a week. All right, uh, looking at weirs, basically a weir is an obstruction that we place in the channel that uh, causes water to back up behind it and flow over it. And typically what we're looking for with these weirs is to induce critical depth over the weir. Uh, we've discussed that in uh, parts of the earlier lectures in terms of some of the problems I've given you, when you where you had the specific energy diagram and you were able to uh, use the specific energy diagram to reason through um, what height you would need to have for the weir or the obstruction to force critical depth. So this is just a continuation of that kind of discussion. And uh, we have two uh, broad character categories for weirs. One is called a sharp crested weir and the other one is a broad crested weir. And the sharp crested essentially as it uh, shows here is very sharp. Uh, you have a nap that uh, springs free and so that, that means that underneath it you have atmospheric uh, pressure conditions, and on top you have atmospheric pressure conditions. Whereas the uh, broad crested weir uh, is uh, is much broader or wider uh, longitudinally along the flow, and you essentially have uh, 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 the flow is in contact with the weir the entire time, so you don't have this nap springing springing clear. Okay, so uh, these are basically um, uh, some some points about the flow over the weirs or weirs in general. Uh, we've already talked about a couple of them. Uh, the, the opening or a notch in terms of the sharp crested weir. Uh, the uh, weirs are, are simple and cheap to put in usually. Uh, it's a common device that we use to measure flows uh, in smaller systems, uh, commonly irrigation ditches. I've mentioned to you that we might put a weir in at a wastewater treatment plant when we're measuring effluent outflow or effluent or influent. Um, the, uh, on, the, on the sharp crested weir, the weir is usually thin and be or beveled with a sharp point to cause water to spring free, uh, free and clear of the, of the weir on the downstream side. This is, we're talking about the uh, nap springing clear, uh, springing free from the weir uh, in the earlier slide. Um, <clears throat> if the water does not spring clear of the weir, then the weir is called a broad crested weir, uh, usually caused by a, a much thicker crest. And there's no hard and fast uh, rule in terms of uh, one versus the other. A lot of this has been developed in the laboratory uh, when we uh, do the, um, you know, confirm the uh, coefficient of the discharge, which we'll talk about in a little while, uh, in terms of the development of those. Um, you know, we, uh, we talk about the air being uh, below the nap. Uh, that's considered free flow over the over the nap, and if you have water on the downstream, the tailwater side backs up over that uh, that free flowing nap. That becomes a, a submerged or a drowned weir, and uh, we can still rate flow that way. It's just you have to take some additional things into consideration. Uh, the downstream water surface elevation is above the uh, weir crest. Uh, we, we really have a hard time uh, rating that, and so the, we, we do have some ways to, to account for that that uh, we'll really not talk about too much in this lecture, but, but it, it becomes a diminished uh, um, accuracy in terms of the weir computation. This is a picture of, a, of an old sharp crested weir. This is one at a U.S. Geological Survey gauging station in Maryland, and you can see that you've got a pool that's upstream here and that you've got this uh, uh, piece of uh, sheet metal um, uh, steel that's uh, basically uh, been um, held up by these uh, two six by six posts and the water, uh, this is a rectangular, um, contracted rectangular weir and so you can see that the nap is springing forward, there's air under here, you can see the water coming over this and so this is a fairly accurate way uh, if you uh, uh, can 
observe the stage up here and you know all the characteristics of the geometry of the weir, this is a fairly accurate way to get a stage discharge relationship and understand what the flow rate is at any particular stage up here, so long as it's acting like as a weir. If, if you get a flood and water is way out here in the floodplain, well, then this is no longer a very good way because you've got water going around the weir and, and there we'd have to come up with a different way to rate this. All right, this is just a, um, a graphic here of, uh, of a sharp crested weir and, and defining uh, basically the reach uh, in question with uh, various section numbers that we will use in our, comp or in our development of the theory to come up with a, an equation that will describe the flow rate based on the various parameters like h and uh, um, the, uh, the velocity and, and the uh, h1 which is the uh, total head over the, over the weir. So if I look at this, again this is another, um, another shot of that uh, same weir. Uh, the, the, the weir uh, shape has to be very sharp. The weir length is small, so this is the length of the weir. The nap is springing clear of the weir. And uh, we're going to take all those things into consideration as we look at this and we're going to run the energy equation between sections 1 and 3. And so here we've got section 1. Uh, just at the very downstream edge of the, the, of the uh, uh, weir crest is uh, section 3. And so we're going to run uh, the energy equation to the place that's immediately downstream of the weir plate and call that section 3. Uh, thing to note here is the nap is not supported from below, so the pressure on the bottom of the nap is zero. The pressure, and we're talking about gauge pressure here, the gauge pressure on the top of the nap is zero, and so uh, we have to look at uh, the hydraulic head at section 3 is not uh, DC, which is the critical depth, uh, but is the average potential energy of the water passing section 3. So we're going to have, for a rectangular shaped weir, the average potential energy is DC over 2, which is the center of the centroid of, of that location. And if it were triangular in the shape of the weir, uh, that is 2 thirds DC. And we'll talk about that in development here in a little bit. All right, writing the energy equation from section 1 to section 3, you can see this is standard traditional uh, development here. You've got alpha 1, V1 squared over 2G. This is the average velocity at section 1 up in the approach. H1 is the, uh, the uh, depth of the uh, flow uh, upstream. And then we're going to call that uh, big H1. And so that's going to be uh, analogous to um, our specific energy E1. And you'll see that development here a little, little bit. If we go to section 3, uh, we're going to, to recognize that we're going to induce critical uh, flow at that particular location. And so the, the velocity is going to be the critical velocity there uh, over 2G, which is the uh, velocity head. And then our, our, um, instead of having our pressure uh, term being H1, which or the depth, the full depth, because it's got atmospheric uh, uh, pressure distribution around uh, on all sides where you've got uh, zero gauge pressure at the bottom, zero gauge pressure at the top, we're going to have the uh, potential energy be DC over 2, which I've already spoken about. The friction loss from 1 to 3, this is this term here, and then we've got the contraction expansion um, coefficient. In this case, it's going to be an, a, a contraction, and that's going to be basically the difference in the velocity at section 3 minus the velocity ahead at section 1. All right. Uh, because the upstream depth, uh, D1, is large compared to the depth of the weir, uh, we can assume that the velocity 1, and we're going to make that assumption, and there are times when we'll have to evaluate that assumption in actual practice and uh, revise our equations accordingly if, we, if that is not a good assumption, if the velocity at section 1 is not uh, very near 0. But in this case, for our development of the equation, we're going to assume that that's essentially approximately equal to 0. We're also going to assume that the distance between, um, because the velocity is low and the distance is, a, is short between section 1 and section 3, we're going to assume that the friction loss is 0. And so our equation uh, that we previously presented here is now essentially H1 is equal to this side of the equation and we're getting rid of the friction loss and the velocity at, uh, at section 1. Now, we also know as I've alluded to, that this H1 is analogous to the specific energy at 1, and because we're having a, a basically um, a very small amount of, of, um, of uh, energy loss between the two, we're going to approximately equate uh, 
E1 approximately equal to E3. Now that's not exactly true because the elevation of the bed, uh, the Z, comes up. And so if you remember the problems we had where we had the broad crested weir, we're not exact, we're making a simplifying assumption here, but, but bear with us. You can look and see what it is. And as you'll notice, this is a theoretical development uh, of, this, of this total equation. We're going to basically get, uh, define the flow rate in terms of some geometry of the, uh, of the weir and the, uh, basically the head over the weir, the H1. And so, as you can see, we're going to develop a, a theoretical uh, equation, and then we will, uh, you know, in, in, in real practice, we actually make flow measurements and hone in on a real proper uh, value for a coefficient of discharge. And that will make more sense here as I go along. But if I assume that, uh, e th that at E, that, that, that this location E1 uh, is equal to E3, we can say that that's the critical specific energy, and that's basically dc over v squared over 2g, which is a, a common form of the specific energy. And we know that that at critical flow situation, that velocity head is simply a half the uh, the critical depth, and then that's basically three halves dc. Which then we can take that and turn it and say that dc is equal to two thirds ec. Or, as we've already stated, we are approximating EC with H1, or two-thirds H1. Now, uh, as we look at this, we plug this uh, uh, concept right here, uh, defining DC at two-thirds H1, into this equation. And um, we can essentially uh, solve for VC is a, a pro, is a function of the square root of H1. And then this is the term, this 4G3. 1 plus Ke is what falls out by collapsing the rest of this information uh, here, uh, algebraically manipulating it to come up with this form. Now, uh, you know, you look at the assumptions. We've got no friction loss between 1 and 3. We're assuming that the velocity at section 1 is equal to 0, and that we have the assumption that E1 is approximately equal to E3, which we know is not exactly true, but this is a theoretical development based on these assumptions. Um, if we look at this further and we recognize that from continuity that the flow rate is equal to the area times the velocity, and we've already made this approximation that the depth at the uh, section 3, which is right through the weir, at the downstream end of the weir, is basically two-thirds h1, which is our uh, development through this part of the previous slide. Uh, we can plug that in for uh, the depth two-thirds h1 would be the depth, dc, and b is the width of this rectangular weir. So that's the area, and then our velocity, this section right here, is taken from this development down here where we've got the velocity at the critical, uh, loca critical location. We essentially have, this is our form of the equation q is equal to two-thirds b, and then this um, um, conglomeration of numbers under the radical times h1 to the 3 halves. Now this simplifies to q is equal to c, b, h to the 3 halves. This is a common form for a weir equation, which be it a sharp crested weir or a broad crested weir, the only difference is going to be this term c, which is the coefficient of discharge. And in this theoretical development, uh, that's 2 thirds uh, the square root of 4, g, 3 times 1 plus the, the, uh, the, the contraction coefficient case of e. And so this would give you a theoretical uh, development of the coefficient c. And uh, that c, um, for theoretical uh, range, so you, you have various uh, values for the k epsilon, or the k uh, e, which is the uh, coefficient uh, uh, for um, uh, the, um, contra the contraction. Uh, that's anywhere from 4.37 down to 3.57 as k e ranges from 0 to 0 0.5. And um, essentially, if you look at this, we've got uh, some, uh, some, some literature that uh, looks at the minimum value of the case, the, the C. Uh, Hulsing uh, was a USGS guy, uh, basically put the minimum at 3.27 and a maximum at 4.29, which is a little bit different than what we have here. Um, you have to use some sort of correction co factor if the weir is smaller than the channel width. So if we got a contract, what's called a contracted weir, we're going to have to correct for that. So again, uh, you've got the Q is equal to C, B, H, 3 half. So the geometry of the, we the rectangular weir, that's uh, based on the, w the B. The H is that the uh, height uh, 
of the flow above the crest of the weir. So if you project back, let's go back a few slides here. If I project back, this H is right here. It's this value of the, of the flow depth over the weir. So it's not the full flow depth. It's basically in relation to this weir. And that's where we get away a little bit um, or we, we, can, we can have a little more uh, good feeling about our assumption that H1 is, e, is approximately equal to E1 because we're referencing the same uh, elevation of, uh, of the, um, you know, ba basically the bed elevation there. So, uh, e, you know, earlier I was saying, okay, well, maybe there's a little bit too much of a stretch there, but it's not as much of, of a stretch as, as you first might, uh, uh, might, might appear. All right, so as we, we look at this, uh, we've got to correct for this contraction. So if we've got uh, a contracted weir, then in, in it's a, a section uh, width B, which is smaller than the actual width of the, of the channel, we have to further correct that a little bit, and there are, are ways to do that. And uh, we'll discuss those in a little bit. Uh, if the, the nap is not fully ventilated or it's not air on the bottom, we also have to correct for that. And again, these corrections, uh, there are theoretical developments of those. Uh, the better way to do it is basically get out there and try to make a flow measurement and come up with your own corrections to the theoretical value of the C. All right. If you look in the textbook and, and the way uh, uh, Larry Mays de develops the, the weir uh, coefficients, he takes a slightly different approach than what I've done. He simply uh, tells you, hey, the uh, velocity at the point in the nap is this uh, square root of 2GH where the H is the uh, depth of, uh, same thing as I had, the, it's the water depth above the uh, crest uh, at, the, at the back end. And he then integrates this uh, Q over the depth to get uh, Q is equal to CWBH to the 3 halves, which is the same uh, form of the equation as I have uh, derived for you earlier in my derivation. Um, you know, he basically, he doesn't tell you how you get this square root of 2GH being the velocity at the nap. And uh, that's basically the same kind of theoretical development as um, I've done where you, you basically assume the fruit number is equal to 1 at the nap and you can get some manipulation and some simplifications. And so uh, I don't want to get too far in the details of, 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 of how to get this square root 2GH. We have a slightly different equation for the velocity at the nap. As you recall, uh, we have this form here, 4G3, 1 plus K sub E times the square root of h1 and so there he's basically saying it's just simply 2g h minus has the uh, the coefficient for uh, the contraction in it and his does not um, if you look at Mays's uh, uh, cw term he basically has this uh, is equal to cd times two-thirds square root of 2g where his uh, cw is is about two uh, 3.33 for english units and this, uh, if it's contracted, the uh, value for B prime, uh, which is going to be substituted for this uh, B up here, is uh, B minus 1.0.1 N uh, times H. N is 1 if the weir is placed against one side versus the other. If the weir is in the middle and it contracts equally on both sides, that N, N is, is equal to 2. All right, the bottom line here is that the, qual the equation that you're using is going to be this Q is equal to C, B, H to the 3 halves. If you use the USGS uh, method for selecting B, uh, selecting the coefficient of discharge C, uh, B is the width of the opening and C is selected from the methodology. I'm not going to get too far deep in the weeds on that. I, I want you to understand the theoretical development and uh, you can come up with a coefficient of discharge there, thereby uh, from that and, and you know if you're out in practice and you and you need to be doing this uh, there are plenty of uh, manuals including the the technique the TWRI which is the techniques of water resource investigation that you can get online from the USGS if you use the the textbook method in, in maze you basically use uh, the, his B prime if it's contracted or use B if it's an uncontracted weir and he has a C value of 3.33. So in the case of the uh, USGS method, you don't have to, to come up with a B prime. That's something, that's something that only Mays does in his development. But you have to stay consistent. If you're going to use the USGS, you have to use the C values as has been derived in their uh, TWRI. If you're going to use Mays, then you use this C is equal to 3.33. And if it's contracted, you have to use... a uh, the B prime according to his equation down here in the bottom right of this uh, graphic.
All right. Uh, if you look at uh, sharp crested weir, this is a, um, a triangular sharp crested weir. Um, the value of theta is right here. We, we are again going through critical depth at the weir. The centroid of the, of the discharge is uh, two-thirds this height. Um, and, and if we would use a, a triangular weir if we had very low flows coming through a particular location, it's much more sensitive because of the triangular nature. You know, a small rise uh, in flow rate uh, you have a larger rise in the in the in the critical depth value than you would if this was rectangular, and that's why we would use a uh, triangular uh, V-notch weir uh, as opposed to a rectangular weir. Um, if we look at we have the same kind of development here, uh, setting the energy equation between sections one and three. In this case, uh, the only difference would be from it in, in the uh, rectangular is that the uh, Potential uh, energy here is represented by two-thirds DC, which is the uh, location of the uh, centroid uh, of that. And so this is what would be our, um, our value for the uh, uh, potential energy at that location. We do our, um, uh, our looks, if we look at the fruit number equal to one, and, and you know, in that whole development calculating the critical depth, um, we basically would recognize that uh, we have a different uh, representation. If you remember the fruit number equal to uh, the velocity divided by the square root of the acceleration of gravity G times the hydraulic depth. Well, that hydraulic depth is different for a rectangle than it would be for a triangle. And so uh, you can look um, at the uh, ge geometry uh, uh, equations I give you for various types of, of, um, of channel cross sections, rectangular versus triangular and uh, essentially we would come up with a hydraulic depth equation which was be, would be different than the hydraulic depth for a rectangle and and the bottom line is that relationship using the fruit number equal to one we come up with a relation of the critical depth to the, the critical velocity of, of this form here four times the square of the velocity at critical divided by 2g and if we we further look at that and look at how that relates to the uh, the energy uh, specific energy E, that's basically uh, four-fifths times the critical energy. And uh, if we equate that to H1, as we had done before in the previous development for sharp-crested rectangular weirs, uh, that would be basically a, approximately EC is approximately equal to H1. So we can say that four-fifths H1. And then our critical velocity through the same development of of using this equation, making the simplifying assumption that V1 squared over 2G is equal to, to zero, and that our friction slope between our friction uh, loss, friction head loss between one and three is equal to zero, we can come up with this as our equation for the critical velocity at the weir, substituting that in as we have done in a previous um, uh, derivation, you know, for the flow rate using continuity, we can say that that simply is. Uh, this uh, uh, exact uh, dimensions here, or this, uh, this form of the equation, 4 fifths h1 squared tangent of theta over 2, where the theta is the angle between the, uh, the notch, or the, the, the angle of the notch, and then this 14g, 15 times 1 plus ke, uh, that under the radical times the square root of h1, that's simply the, the velocity at, uh, at that uh, uh, critical of uh, flow location at the at the weir uh, crest itself and so then we've got this form of the uh, equation can simplify down to q is equal to tangent of theta over 2 c h 3 halves and essentially this c is this uh, this form right here and that's the theoretical development and again if we're doing this in the field it's always good to take a few flow measurements when it's actually working to make sure that this value of c is accurate. If not, we would adjust it to whatever we have for a, a, an actual value. And, and so th that would help us hone in also on this case of E. All right, so uh, if you've got a case of E of 0.5 for sharp const uh, constricted entrances, um, you know, that basically that C for a triangular uh, weir is going to be 2.86. Uh, and for a 60 degree weir, which is fairly typical in practice, uh, the C ranges from 2.46 up to 2.48. So there's not a, a large amount of, uh, of variation based on the uh, 
the the angle that that's a 2.48 for a 90 degree weir. This is very close to what Mays has as a 2.5 value for his uh, in in the textbook for a 90 degree weir. Uh, if we uh, have a submergence uh, of the of the tail uh, where we don't have a real uh, good uh, nap springing clear where it's aerated well under the bottom, uh, we have a way to correct for that coming up with a KT value which is the tailwater elevation. H1 is the uh, obviously the head above the weir uh, upstream. This is the uh, formulation to get a KT, which would be a correction, and we would apply that times the uh, C value to uh, come up with a correction for the value of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the C, which would then Im impact how we uh, have the, uh, the, f the equation for the uh, the flow over the triangular weir, which is Q is equal to C, B, H to the three halves. So that C would be adjusted by this value of KT. All right. Uh, we have other types of sharp crested weirs. And I'm not going to go through all those. There are equations developed uh, for these similar to what we've done for the rectangular and triangular. This is a Cipolletti or a or trapezoidal weir. Uh, we also have various crazy shapes that you can en encounter out there. Uh, a proportional weir. This is approximate uh, exponential weir. These are various types of weirs and, and these again would have specific applications uh, maybe like a wastewater treatment plant or uh, something of that nature. Alright so let's move to a broad crested weir uh, and this again we have uh, no aeration so you've got a, a, a long distance L here. This is much wider than or longer than a, a sharp crested weir and we've got some submerged flow down here so we don't have anything springing flow, uh, free so you have to you have to go through this process we're assuming the critical depth happens at the downstream end of the of the weir uh, itself the broad crested weir and so you can see section one section two and section three and and we look at using those definitions in the development of the broad crested weir equation and so similarly to what we've seen in the in the, the development for the sharp crested weirs uh, we have the velocity uh, and the, uh, uh, the depth at uh, section 1. Then we go down to section 3, running our equation uh, to the location where it's at critical flow. And there should be a squared in here. That's a, that's a mistake on the notes. I need to correct that. That should be VC squared over 2G plus the critical depth uh, plus the head loss from uh, section 1 to 2. And then you've got the uh, friction loss and the head loss from section 2 to 3. And you get this entrance loss, uh, H sub E. Um, we're again going to make the assumption that V1 is equal to approximately equal to, to zero. Then uh, and H uh, F1 to 2 is also quite small and equal to zero. Uh, and we're going to make that the the assumption that the weir length is, is relatively small. Um, and we're going to assume that the friction loss from 2 to 3 is equal to zero. So we're going to eliminate uh, this term. Uh, this term here, this term here, and um, in the uh, entrance loss equation, H sub E will we'll eliminate the uh, V1 uh, in that as well. And so as we come through here, again, this is the H sub E, the entrance loss. It's the difference between the velocity heads upstream and downstream. And so we get the entrance loss is simply K sub E times VC squared over 2G. And if I substitute this and arrange, rearrange the energy equation, uh, I get uh, H1 is equal to DC plus VC over, and again, that should be VC squared over 2G. That's another uh, mistake that's perpetuated from the previous slide. Um, we further can develop that looking at the fruit number equal to 1 at the uh, location of critical depth. And so that uh, uh, goes along the same development we had for the sharp crested weir. We can say that the DC is equal to 2 thirds H1. Rearranging things and substituting, we get this to be our velocity at the critical location. And if you remember back where we had the rectangular sharp crested weir, that was 4G3, 1 plus K sub E, the, the difference being that the way that the um, potential energy at the critical depth location there, if you recall, was DC over 2. Here it's DC alone, and so that's why that's the only difference in these, uh, these, uh, the development. And so we have a slightly different form uh, where the, the um, Velocity of critical is is kind of the square root of two larger than the um, the velocity for a broad crested. So the, the the velocity of the sharp crested is the square root of two 
uh, bigger than the velocity critical for the broad crested weir, and so that's reflected, in, you know, which you can see here from this development. Uh, if I plug that back in, again, remembering that I have the continuity equation, Q is equal to A times the velocity, so the area is B times the, the depth of critical over the, of the, uh, over the weir times the VC at the weir. Plugging those together, I've got this, uh, a form of the equation for the broad-crested weir, and I'm letting C be this, uh, this uh, business here in the middle. I can come up with, again, Q is equal to C, B, H1 over 3 half, uh, to the 3 halves power. Again, that's the same uh, form of the, uh, of the equation you have for sharp-crested weir. Uh, the only difference is the value for C, and here is the C value for the, um, for the broad-crested weir, and we can come up with ways to correct that. This is a theoretical development. Uh, we have uh, things that uh, in the TWRIs for the USGS, we would have ways to correct the, the case of R, uh, through case of R, case of S. These are rounding values for how rounded the weir is. That would affect this case of E um, and, and a, a number of other things. So the, again, this, the base coefficient C prime here in this development is two-thirds 2g, 3 times 1 plus k sub e, that's under the radical, that corresponds to this, and so that would go up into the c prime, and then these va various values would be ways that we would correct it based on what we observed the weird to have. And so if you look at this, um, you've got, um, you know, looking at variations based on whether the slope is vertical or whether the slope is uh, horizontal, uh, I mean not horizontal, but uh, more gradually slope 2 on 1, uh, this is the slope of the upstream face, so you've got some variations of C, and you can see if it's uh, uh, the H over L, which is your, your L being the length of the weir. These are various ways to look at getting a, a, a more refined way to get the value of the C uh, with uh, various uh, differences in the, in the way that the broad-crested weir is, uh, is shaped. Okay, um, You'd also look at other things too, but um, I've got some. Uh, I've got an extra handout in in on Blackboard, which kind of goes through that development uh, by the USGS. You can look through that and, and see ways that we we would correct. And this particular graph is in there. Uh, and and again, I I can't prepare you for all. Uh, you know, it's beyond the scope of the class and the time I've got allotted. I really want to give you kind of a vocabulary with weirs in, in case you counter them in practice, uh, understanding kind of how uh, the equations came to be, and then you just need to know that you're going to alter that coefficient of discharge or that contraction coefficient C is going to be altered based on uh, what kind of weir you've got there, and, and so you have to take a number of things into, into uh, consideration. All right, so if we look at broad-crested weirs in general, um, your C values are going to vary from 3.09 down to 2.52. Um, you know, if you've got a... A, a very gradual contraction, a very smooth opening, uh, that's at the 3.09. Uh, you'd have a very small contraction ratio. Um, at uh, k sub e equal to 0 0.5, that's the, the high end of, of representing a very sharp, non-streamlined opening, and our coefficient c is going to be 2.52. And so um, if, you, if you have the lower the value of c, uh, that you know directly is proportional to the Q in that equation. Q is equal to C B H to the three halves, and so the lower that value of C, then the less efficient the weir is in terms of getting water across it, and the um, and the lower your value of Q is going to be. All right, so let's uh, that's our, our weirs. Let's move into to flumes, which are also uh, used to um, to gauge flow, and this is a, a, a large partial flume, and I'll have one that I'll bring to the field with us on one of on our field trip but essentially it's a way to force critical depth if I've got flow going from left to right here uh, and I put a gauging station where I'm going to gauge the flow depth out here I uh, essentially with a partial flume it's a very uh, um, it's a constriction it's also a, a, a bump in the b bottom channel at the at the base and so it, it forces through the throat here you're trying to get critical flow depth to occur. And there's been a lot of development over the years on these uh, partial flumes uh, that basically, theoretically, we can rate those. And so if we know what the water surface elevation is upstream, 
and we can we we can then say okay for a particular type of geometry of partial flume for that flow depth this is the flow rate and here's a partial flume that uh, I helped design on the University of Illinois campus we put a we have a stream gauge here that uh, uh, basically uh, is funded by uh, the USGS and the state of Illinois and the university and the cities of Champaign and Urbana to measure flow and when we redid this portion of campus uh, I actually was able to design a broad crested weir in concert with a partial flume and the partial flume is here in the middle of the weir and so for low flow uh, we have a very accurate way to measure the flow here and I've got sensors in the water up here measuring the the elevation of the water surface above this partial flume and we have a very accurate uh, rating of what this is at low flow and then as the flow goes up we we have the broad crested weir in concert with the partial flume and there's a way to rate that theoretically and then as we get farther and farther higher and higher well then we have to rely on flow measurements to have a rating because the uh the this is serving as a control feature to force critical depth starts to uh to uh, uh, dampen out as we go higher and higher in flow. And so uh, for partial flumes, uh, the, the width is a, cr a critical measure. Uh, the value for the, um, the A, which I'm looking forward here, I think that's the, uh, uh, what the heck is that? Okay, so that's the length of this uh, wall here. Uh, you've also got B, which is the, uh, the length, um, so this is the linear length of the wall. So I'm looking down here. This is in plan view. Uh, the, the length of the wall is A. The length of the flow as it's going uh, longitudinally is B. You have various values of this, and you can combine these, and it allows you to come up with a rating for, um, uh, of, for this. You know, We theoretically rate that. But this tells you, okay, if I'm looking at a minimum value of flow and a maximum value of flow, let's say that I wanted to go from very small flows to about four cubic feet per second, this is what I would design my partial flume to be. This would be all the design dimensions, you know, W, A, B, C, D, E, F. That's all the things that you would you would look at to get yourself a value for the uh, for design uh, to building this. And this is essentially what we did at the University of Illinois when I was looking at the flow rates that we wanted to to have in this design. Um, for partial flumes, if the width, which is basically the width of the throat here, as the flow goes from left to right through this th flow throat, uh, if I've got between one foot and eight foot width, this is the equation that I would use to define my flow rate. is equal to four times the width times the height of the um, of the flow above the uh, where, where we were monitoring it times uh, to the 1.522 times W 0.26 power. Uh, if it's a six inch, uh, this it becomes my flow uh, equation. If it's a nine inch, this becomes my flow equation. So um, this just gives you an example of what those partial flume equations are. They're developed uh, through uh, laboratory flume studies, also some theoretical analysis, but it's, it's kind of beyond the time I've got to, to go through that and to understand exactly how that happens. Um, now I want to switch. The, we've been talking about weirs and, and flow structures to actually measure the flow. Uh, here I'm going to talk about the velocity area method that we use and this is what we're going to use in the laboratory uh, when, we, when we go out and we actually make a flow measurement uh, hopefully on the little piney, it might be on Spring Creek depending on the flow conditions. Um, the discharge is usually measured using the velocity area method. This is the common way that USGS measured it and essentially it uses the continuity equation where I take the and figure out the cross-sectional area times the water velocity to get my flow rate. Now uh, if I just take and say I've got this natural cross-sectional area, this is a this is a, a, a side view, a, a cross-section plot of the uh, depth, and, and this would be the water surface up here. We, if I take, I, it's very easy to measure the area. I say relatively easy to measure the area, but I don't know really where to measure my velocity in one spot to be able to get it. So what we do is we discretize uh, the cross-section into various sub-areas, and into sub uh, sections, we measure the area, uh, the sub area of each subsection, and measure the velocity in that. And so that's much um, a better way of doing it because if I had to take just the whole area times the mean velocity, well, where out here do I measure? So what I'm doing is I'm going to break the the uh, area into various subsections, measure the area of each subsection, multiply the velocity of that subsection, which we have uh, rules that we use to to govern that. 
uh, where we pick our locations, and then I will uh, so, uh, just simply sum them up. And I, I sum up all these little sub uh, flow rates, and I get the total flow rate at the entire uh, entire um, uh, cross section. So we measure the width and depth of each little sub area, and then we measure the uh, um, the velocity at a couple locations. Uh, if it's uh, and those rules are, are basically. Uh, we're, whether it's a depth of certain point, if it's very shallow, we measure it at six tenths below the water surface. If I'm using a mechanical meter or a hydroacoustic meter in a waiting situation, if it's it's above uh, a foot and a half deep uh, or two two and a half feet deep, if I'm using a Price AA current meter, I'm going to measure at two tenths below the water surface and eight tenths below the the water surface. So if this is a depth of ten feet here. I'm going to measure two tenths uh, times uh, ten feet would be two feet. So two feet below the water surface, I'd measure. That's the two tenths uh, depth, and then the eight tenths depth is eight tenths times the total depth. That's going to be at eight feet below the water surface, and I'll average the two, and that's going to be my estimate of the mean velocity. Uh, this is a Price AA current meter. We're going to see this in the field. This is old technology. Uh, looks like a wind speed anemometer, but basically it's calibrated to we count the revolutions in so many seconds. That gives us an estimate of the, the velocity at that particular location or that particular point in the cross section. Um, if again, if I'm doing this, I take the total discharge is, is all the little uh, sub areas times all the, the, the velocities and that gives me a, a flow rate at each uh, location or at each subsection and I go across and sum them. And I'm going to apply that. I'm going to come up with a rating curve which tells me the stage or the water surface stage versus the discharge. This is called a rating curve and this is the way that uh, you know a, a large proportion of the USGS uh, gauging stations they measure the stage 24 hours seven days a week and uh, they don't measure the discharge directly but they indirectly determine it by a means of a rating curve. So if I've got a stage of 10 feet I go to my rating curve which we do this automatically using computer programs. We get the stage out of the, out of the field through satellite telemetry. We know what the stage is. We say it's 10 feet. We go to the rating curve and says, okay, well, that's basically about 800 cubic feet per second. So we would report that the stage at 10 a.m. is 10 feet with a discharge of 800 CFS. Now, that may be a Sunday morning at 6 a.m. There's nobody out there, but we're actually able to report that on the web in, in near real time because of, of the, we have the rating curve. All right, so we have to measure the discharge at all stages to build this rating curve. So our field staff are out there at various times. We're making those flow measurements. Here's a, a, a low flow. We're actually volumetrically catching what comes out of there. You know, you can't do that at, at medium and high flows. We're making these flow measurements and uh, having to do that. Now, uh, you know, indirect, sometimes we can't collect these. Uh, at uh, at high stages because they, it happens so fast that we can't get out there in time and that's where it comes into the play the the indirect methods which I covered slope area technique earlier in the semester and so if uh, you know the 2013 Colorado floods uh, you know we went out and made a whole bunch of indirect measurements where we surveyed the channel geometry got the high water marks and we're able to back calculate using energy concepts what the flow rate would be to to have that combination of channel geometry and the water surface profile. Uh, here's a, just a ma measurement that's being made. You can see the USGS stream gauge is, is here in the background. This is uh, at Hecker, Illinois on Richland Creek. And we actually have road overflow here. And I've got the, the field hydrographers actually uh, measuring the velocity at this location. And they're doing this all across there. They'd have a, a different set of equipment to measure the main channel here as the river goes under the bridge but for coming across the highways, wading along through here, making the flow measurement. All right, uh, we have an online course that the USGS has for making wading measurements of Q, and this is the URL that you can access to get to that. Um, we've had uh, lots of advances in technology, so I'll just say that you can look up all the nuances of making flow measurements. We will actually do this in a lab uh, exercise here coming up. Um, now, I've been talking to you about the mechanical meters that we have, but we have a lot of advances in technology through hydroacoustics. And if you look at this graphic, this is the Colorado River at Lease Ferry, which is above the Grand Canyon. And so the flow measurements that we were making in 1890 were the same ones we were making in 1996 in terms of the technology.
you, you can see the, the sounding weight and the mechanical current meter, the AA price current meter over the top of it. And here's the gauging station in the uh, background here. Um, but in recent years, in the last 15 to 20 years, we've been developing acoustic technology. This is uh, using hydroacoustics to basically uh, bounce sound off of the uh, particles in the water and come up with a velocity uh, using uh, the Doppler principle to measure the velocity. And so uh, basically this is what this unit looks like. We would still go out and discretize the cross section and a weighting measurement and we would go across. Now, uh, if we've got deeper measurements, uh, an even more promising or deeper flows, uh, we use something called an ac acoustic Doppler current profiler, which uh, doesn't, uh, you don't have to actually place a meter. Uh, this is a hydroacoustic meter. We have to place it at a particular location in the vertical and it gets a point velocity, the same thing that the mechanical meters were doing. But in, in water deep enough, we actually can deploy acoustic Doppler current uh, profiler technology, which basically is, is boat mounted or surface mounted in some form or another. Uh, and we can actually go across the channel and it not only uh, looks at the velocity uh, at, at multiple points, it can, it can it make a resolution of the velocity in three dimensions every uh, couple centimeters if we set the, uh, if we set the uh, settings on the meter to do that. Um, we can, it also determines what the, the depth is. And this is a measurement that I made on the Mississippi River below Carroll, Illinois at, at a place called Wycliffe, Kentucky, which basically, if you're familiar, the Mississippi River comes in on the left. This is a Carroll, Illinois in the middle. This is the uh, Mississippi River coming in, and this is the Ohio River coming in. So this is just below the Ohio, the uh, confluence with the Ohio River. This is during the, the uh, 2011 floods, which are, were, you know, were, were huge floods. And this is what the acoustic Doppler current profile, this is over a, uh, almost two miles wide here. And we had 118 feet of depth over near the Kentucky shore. And as it goes across, this is the Missouri shoreline over here. And we're able to get three dimensional velocities and the depth. And you're actually able to make a very accurate flow measurement without putting any meters in the water. Everything is in this boat here uh, mounted on the surface. And this is the instrument they were using, which has uh, got four transducers uh, it uh, is able to get the velocities in three dimensions. It is able to get the depth. It's able to track its position. We use GPS in this uh, particular case to do that, and we can get a very accurate um, a way to look at the flow depth or at the um, at the um, discharge. And so, what is an ADCP? It's acoustic Doppler current profiler. So it uses sound. That's the acoustic part. The Doppler uses the uh, measures the velocity based on the Doppler shift principle. Uh, C, the current, it measures the water velocity, and the profiler part is it measures velocity points, not just a single point velocity like we would have for a, a mechanical meter, uh, but it measures it throughout the profile of the water, of the water depth. Um, we do a number of things. Obviously, we, we measure the discharge. Uh, we can uh, uh, look at channel bathymetry. It sends us an acoustic pulse, and so we can actually see what's kind of what what the amount of scatterers are that's in the water. So we can correlate that to to the amount of sediment or um, uh, biomatter that's in the in the water column. And uh, there's a number of things that we can do with this with this technology. Um, you know, the previous slide I showed you a man boat where we're actually out there in a boat. We also have tethered boats where we have, uh, this is a, a two pontoons with the meter in the middle. Uh, we have various ways that we can, you know, if we don't want to put a man boat in the water, we can actually tether it off of a bridge. So you've got a tether line here and the person's towing it off the bridge back and forth from one side to the other. This is just an output from the from the computer software that, that uh, kind of gives you a number of diagnostics and, and you can see it as it goes across. So that's it for this lecture. Uh, thank you for uh, listening.